All right, I think it's uh, almost time. Uh, so uh, we, we have already uh, uh, 26 participants. Uh, so um, uh, I would like to start uh, today's uh, seminar, Eisner Eisner Seminar. And Eisner Seminar Series uh, has been initiated in uh, 2010 uh, with the beginning of Eisner. And since then, uh, we have uh, prominent researchers from around the world uh, giving uh, seminars at our institute uh, on topics related to renewable energy, green energy, material science, and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, my, my name is Alexander Stajkov, and uh, I, I believe most of you know me. Uh, I work in Eisner for over 10 years, and I work in the field of uh, theoretical chemistry and computational material science. And uh, it is my uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce today uh, Professor Thomas uh, Lippert, uh, who is a collaborator and friend of mine. Uh, Professor Lippert has a very rich scientific career. Uh, he works at the uh, Paul Scherer Institute, and he's a group leader there since uh, 2002, uh, so almost uh, 20 years uh, already. Uh, he received in 2002 his habilitation uh, in ETH Zurich in the field of physical chemistry. Uh, and uh, since uh, then, uh, he works uh, in ETH Zurich as a professor in the Department of Chemistry and uh, Applied Bioscience Laboratory of Inorganic Chemistry. Uh, Professor Lippert has uh, a very rich scientific career, uh, over uh, 300 publications, uh, scientific uh, talks on uh, large number of uh, conferences. He is editor in chief of uh, Applied Physics, um, uh, uh, Journal of Applied Physics A, uh, and also editor in Applied Surface Science. Uh, today, uh, Professor Lippert will talk about thin films prepared by PLD uh, model systems for studies uh, using large facilities techniques. Thomas, please, uh, without further ado, please start your presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Alex, and thanks for all of you to being present and, of course, for the opportunity to show some of our research. And as you can see, I'm from the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, and I choose also this topic to highlight really some of our specific po possibilities we have at PSI. You can see here that our, here's our synchrotron, here's a spallation neutron source, and here's a free electron laser. So we are really have a lot of possibilities to use large facilities, and we of course try to apply them for our research. So of course, I would like to thank first before there's no time at the end to thank, of course, all the people who have done the work. So all the shoulders, I'm staying on it. So it's mainly my group with my PhD students in Bolt here, several groups at in Switzerland, at Eisner, ETH, Romania, and of course, most important, of course, also all the funding sources which uh, supported my research and my students over the last whatever more than 20 years. So. With this, I would like to start, come to the part of the talk and outline of the talk will be, I will give you an introduction. Of course, for many of you, the introduction will be more or less uh, well known about water splitting. And then we go to oxynitrites, which is our main topic we work off and then thin films, which is again, one of the topics of my group that we are specialized in making thin films. And then I selected two different or three different approaches, which are all centered in the application of large facilities and what we can learn by applying large facilities for certain materials or for certain processes. So if you think about energy, it's of course, uh, we have to, we all know that uh, uh, global energy consumption is increasing, increasing, increasing. And today we mainly use fossil fuels. And of course, fossil fuels have certain disadvantages. So first of all, they are limited. So last whatever from 2015 there were 15 to 110 years which will be the reserves for the large facilities but the other of course very important aspect if you use uh, if you use the fossil fuels for for energy production then we have co2 pollution and here you see one of my former phd students uh, he's from near Beijing, and you can see here what the pollution can really do and how much CO2 is emitted to the atmosphere. And to overcome this, of course, is one thing would be to use renewable energies. And renewable energies, of course, has a range of different possibilities. So wind, biomass, geothermal, hydro, but of course, the most important renewable energy source would be solar, which would give us 36,000 terawatts. So meaning in principle, if we would uh, use a 10% efficiency of solar conversion, 0.16% uh, of the land on earth need to be covered 
to really have a complete have the complete energy for the world on renewable basis. Of course, this is uh, sounds like not so much, but if you look at this map here, you can see that for the projection for 2030, we would need about 500,000 square kilometers of land to be covered with so for solar to really produce the energy for the world. You can see here, this could be a possible distribution with these squares. You can see also in Japan, there would be something. And of course, 500,000 square kilometers would be more than Japan. So it's it's not small, but still it's possible specifically if you look at these areas like here in the Sahara. But one thing, of course, which we have to think about is uh, when we use solar, how we do it. So if you use solar cells, then we generate electricity only during the daytime when the sun shines. A possible addition or alternative to it would be using the solar to generate a chemical fuel. So using solar water splitting. And solar water splitting has very often been com uh, compared to something like photo to photosynthesis, meaning you have uh, more or less use the sunlight to create chemical energy. And the chemical energy is an can be compared, of course, to the same way if you do uh, artificial photosynthesis, but using water splitting to generate hydrogen as an energy carrier. And of course, this energy carrier, you can produce this either directly with uh, a photocatalysis to make hydrogen, or you can use it with a couple to electrolysis. So this is something to be decided on, but this would be one way how to create a chemical fuel such as hydrogen with sunlight. So if you think about hydrogen, of course, hydrogen is long known for a long time. So since 1625, Van Helmont described it first and it was named in, by Lavoisier in 783. And of course, 1910 came a very important process for hydrogen, the Haber-Bosch process. But if you think about hydrogen, then if we, the main part is currently the production of hydrogen is 50% from natural gas and 30% from oil. So meaning this is not really a renewable process. So in principle, we can also use water, which would be the environmentally most friendly process. But the question is how we produce this by which process. So we can have use electro electrolysis or photocatalysis, which is a topic I will speak more about it today. So how can we use hydrogen is of course very obvious. We can use uh, we can use it directly, convert it directly to electrical energy in a fuel cell. We can use it in a combustion engine, or we can use it again to create a liquid fuel such as methanol or ammonia. So there are many possibilities. So it looks like that hydrogen would be a very, very good energy carrier for an environmentally friendly renewable energy carrier in the future. And this is a strong belief that this will be coming also. We will see how soon and how fast it will come. But if you think about it, who suggested this first? This is something which I looked recently up and I found it very interesting that the idea about using hydrogen as a, as a carrier for, uh, for energy does not come from a scientist, it comes from a novelist. So it comes from Jules Verne. So in, uh, he wrote already in 1874 in the mysterious island that hydrogen should be the carrier for energy. So, and this is out of this book. So said burn instead, what to burn instead of coal, water. So you burn water. So yes, water to heat water. So said, yes, said you have to decompose water and make electricity out of it. So meaning already 1874, way before any one of us or any scientist was thinking about this kind of energy carrier, Jules Verne was already thinking about this. So again, so this is a very nice uh, sign that even novelists or writers come up with ideas which we much, much later only uh, transfer to real world. But if you think now a little bit more about water splitting, then of course we all know <clears throat> that we need to put energy inside to produce hydrogen out of water. So and if we use, if you think about this, then we have a potential to create hydrogen and oxygen. So meaning if we use a semiconductor photocatalyst to do this, then we create holes with sunlight and electrons. The holes will be used to make hydrogen, while as a, a oxygen, sorry, and the uh, electrons will be used to create hydrogen. So meaning in this case, if we think about the requirements for our semiconductor, so we should have some, a band gap in the visible range because to make good use of the sunlight, the band edges would straddle the O2 and hydrogen evolution potential. And of course, for us, I'm a chemist, most important, it needs to have a chemical and structural stability. So we need to be able to produce hydrogen 
consistently over a long time without degradation of the material. And this is one of our difficulties we have. So if you look at the range of different materials which when, can be used, then of course the most famous one, which goes back to the very, very important paper of Fujishima and Honda from 72. So titanium dioxide is of course the most common or the most well-known material, but it has one problem that the band edges in the UV. And of course, UV would be only something like 3% of the solar light, meaning efficiency in this case would be a big problem how to achieve this. So while we should use visible light, which accounts for 44%, so meaning we have to go from the UV to the visible with a band gap of some materials. So there's a range of semiconductors which would fulfill this requirement quite well, like cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, but these have a problem with stability. And since there are a range of other materials, which is also, which would be nice like iron oxide, because it would be cheap, abundant materials, but they have problems with the uh, band edges and also they're limited in efficiency. So for hematite, which is one of the most studied materials, you get a theoretical efficiency of five, 15%, but using all tricks, we know until now 5% was the upper limit, which has been achieved to uh, get with this material. There's, a, there's of course a lot of research in addition to the other, let's say more abundant and easy materials like cadmium sulfide, but they have really problems with uh, stability. So the sulfur is the problem in this case, the so sulfur vacancies are formed and you get photooxidation at the interface. And of course also cadmium sulfide is toxic, so which is also quite bad. One of the other materials which has been studied quite a lot is copper oxide, which has a very promising band gap. Uh, so abundance would be okay. It's not very stable, but with protecting layers, you could overcome this, but it has also one major problem, which uh, is an unfavorable ratio of carrier diffusion length and light absorption depths. So which means that you have a carrier diffusion length of 200 nanometers, but for absorption, you would need one micron thick uh, layer. So meaning it's problematic, but Anyhow, they are used and studied quite a lot and in tandem cells up to three to 4% are reached, but just, which is still not enough. So we still need to increase this first. I'll come back to this in one of my next slides. The materials which are um, newer in this range, which are not as long and old known are since the class of materials, which are oxynitrates. These are the materials we are working on. And of course, oxynitrates have been pioneered by uh, Kazunari Domen um, in Japan a lot. He was one of the first to report on this. And why are they interesting? Here you see just the example of tantalum oxide. So what you can see is the effect of nitrogen substitution into the oxide is that I narrow the band gap. So meaning I go from a UV band gap to a band gap in the visible range. So meaning now I can make use of more light and I still have the edges of the bands in a, in a nice range. And you can see that the different oxynitrites are colorful pigments. So I mean, I can we can even tune the absorption of these materials to ranges which are uh, useful for application of using solar light and the visible range of the solar light. So if you look now in more detail at the oxynitrites, what is at the moment the state of the art is something like 6.8% were reported in 2021 of apparent quantum yield while there's a theoretical limit of around 16% for oxynitrites, meaning there's still quite a big gap between what is theoretically possible to achieve and what is achieved. And why, where are the problems? Why we cannot go higher than this number? And this one is, at least it was claimed in this paper, that this is a 10 to even higher increase of the possible numbers. One of the main problems oxynitrates have is stability. For example, nitrogen evolution, so meaning we are losing the nitrogen in the structure is one of our main problems we have. And this is of course, a very negative problem. So, and one of our topics is trying to understand this. And I just wanted to give you a number set in principle for being industrial attractive. So something like 10% of solar to hydrogen should be reached. But then the next question is how we uh, apply this. I will skip the first part of the slide. Just going the main part here is um, 
What we are looking at is at the oxygen evolution mainly because this is a rate determining step during water splitting since it needs more carriers and has a slower kinetics compared to hydrogen evolution. So meaning we look at the photo anodes uh, and semiconductor where the minority holes go to the surface. And this is the oxynitrites in this case. So we look mainly at this part of the reaction. So meaning again, if you look at the different approaches, how we could split water, it goes from photovoltaic electrolysis to photoelectrochemically. And in this case, this is the approach we are looking at. We're looking at the photo anode with a cathode with an applied bias, while the other possibilities would be photocatalysis, but we are focusing on this aspect. And of course, there are many different approaches and there's a lot of ongoing research to go from a single component photocatalyst to heterojunctions to set schemes. And even the newest approaches are using solid electron mediators, not uh, liquid ones, and having internal electric fields to support this process. As I said, many, many groups work on the aspect of how to increase the efficiency of these systems, uh, increase the uh, solar to hydrogen ratio. But when we do this, there's two things which we have to keep in mind at the end for an application is the system complexity and the efficiency. And of course, the more complex the system we make, the higher in efficiency we have to go. So as I said, so 10% is considered to be a starting point for being really attractive or slightly below, but the more complex the system we make, the higher efficiency we need. So meaning we are in the hunt of increasing the efficiency. And of course, for this, one part is to understand where are our problems or which, are, which process are limiting the efficiency. And this is what we are looking at. So as I said, we look at some oxides, but mainly we're looking at oxynitrites. And why are we using oxynitrites? One, one thing is, of course, which is an important aspect for my students is that we are one of the own few groups in the world who can prepare them as thin film. So meaning we have a unique position in this case. And we look at new materials. So we work close together with modeling groups, which suggest new materials, which has until now, I have to say, not been super successful, that we find new, more um, efficient materials. We try new approaches like the coupling with bio, it's a cooperation with Tatsumi Ishihara, and then we look mainly at thin films. And there are four different aspects which we look at, so it's understanding the band gap, influence of crystallographic orientation, because this is again one thing which we can do and not many people can do, we look in, into improving stability and we want to understand the degradation of the process, as I mentioned before, and for this, we use large facilities. And this will be the main topic of my talk. So as I said, thin films are of course used in many um, applications as active components, but on the other side, they're also perfect model systems. So I don't claim that we will do PLD films and using them in an application, but they are perfect for studying properties because we have almost, we have very, very well-defined materials with almost perfect surfaces, which are of course the best for having fundamental studies to understand properties. And you will see another, um, reason later why we need thin films with a perfect surface. So how we make this is one of the approaches why we are still one of the unique groups to make this. We use a pulsed laser deposition, but coupled with the ammonia gas pulse. And the ammonia gas pulse is of course something which not many people do as most PLD chambers are run by physicists, so and they don't let ammonia being inside of vacuum chambers. So we made a specific chamber, or two of them now, where we have ammonia inside, and ammonia is really the key to create oxynitrates, as you can see here. Is if we use nitrogen, we get a much much lower amount of uh, nitrogen into the films, while ammonia is really the best one to control and have a high amount of. Uh, uh, nitrogen in an oxygen and an oxide inside. So meaning really ammonia in this case is really the key to do and also this process with a gas pulse means a much, much higher uh, nitrogen introduction into an oxide film as compared to just using a background of ammonia. Meaning our system is really quite unique to make these in films. And this is of course one of our advantages that we are one of the few groups who can really do oxynitrites in films. And the first topic for us to look at the oxynitrates is to understand the band gap. As mentioned before, oxynitrites are made because you can narrow the band gap as compared to the parent oxide. So if you look at this, 
we have to see then, of course, what is really happening if you put a nitrogen into an oxide structure. And normally it has been suggested that the nitrogen incorporation increases the level of surveillance band. So we have the N2P at the top level of surveillance band and surveillance band gets lifted up, making in this case the, uh, the band gap narrower. But how we can do this to really study what happens is one of the keys is to compare an oxide to an oxynitrite and then being able to study the valence band and conduction band. And this is of course one of the ongoing discussions we have with Alex is what is the best oxide to compare to an oxynitrite? So in this case, we use lanthanum titanium oxide compared to the lanthanum uh, titanium oxynitrite because they have a similar crystal, they have the same crystalline structure. But if we do this in this case, we got for a thin film for both of these things for materials, we got a band gap narrowing by 0.96 EV. So we got really the introduction of nitrogen changed the band gap by 0.96 EVs. This is depending on the amount of nitrogen we have inside. So if you would have complete nitrogen substitution, the band gap would be even larger. But keep this number in mind because this is something which we try to probe. And then one approach is how we get really the level of valence band and conduction band. One case would be, of course, we can ask theoreticians to model it, but I'm on the experimental side, so the question is, can we measure this? And yes, we can measure this. We can use X-ray absorption, X-ray emission spectroscopy, where the X-ray absorption spectroscopy will give us a conduction band, and uh, X-ray emission spectroscopy will give us a valence band. So meaning in this case, so we can look at the titanium in this case, and then we get really valence band maximum and conduction band minimum levels by directly measurements. And this is how a typical spectrum in this case looks like. We measure the excitation energy versus emission energy, and then we get unoccupied and occupied states in this case. And if we plot this then in detail, in this case, looking at the valence band edge, then we can see that the hybridization of oxygen 2p by nitrogen 2p orbitals gives us a shift of 0.66 eV, which is not the same which we measured for the band gap of the material, meaning we are still missing roughly 0.3 EV. So meaning just the valence band edge, which normally all people claim is the reason why what changes when we put a nitrogen into oxygen is not enough to explain the difference between oxide and oxynitrites. So therefore we looked then also in the conduction band edge and then we can see that in this case, we get a downward shift of the conduction band of 0.28 EVs. And then of course, if we combine these two, then we are very close now to the measurements which we have for the thin films. So meaning in this case, we could identify a new um, part of what oxy and nitrogen in the oxides will do. So we have, of course, like everyone claimed before, shift of valence band to the higher energies from the hybridization of 2p orbitals with uh, n2p orbitals, but we get also a shift of the conduction band to lower energies. And then if we consider both, then we get a very good agreement because between the UV with spectroscopy and X-ray measurements. Of course, we still have the open question, what is the origin of the shift of conduction band to lower energies? So there's been several possibilities, so reduction of the distortion, so structural, reason, electronegativity, change difference between oxygen and nitrogen. And of course, there's a more fundamental thing, as I said, there's an ongoing project with Alex is, which is the correct oxide to compare to the oxynitrate really to see uh, what happens between the two materials. And this is still something which we are still trying to figure out. But then after, after having the first input on systems, of course, we looked now at one material. We have now the data for several materials. So we try to understand the oxynitrite better, but then the next part is of course, to look at the photocatalytical properties. So what are the properties we have here? So one thing is of course, is this would be a typical, how it would look like we need in addition an, uh, conducting layer for the oxynitrite. But the first thing which we see is that we see which all the other people have reported that we see a decay of activity. So this is one thing is what is the origin of this, that we have an initial fast decay and then it becomes more stable. And then of course, we have to add a co-catalyst or a catalyst on the oxynitrate to make it more efficient. 
So we see an increase of efficiency. You see just one example can be even much higher census, but we see also that by adding this catalyst, we increase the stability. So the other thing is we try to understand what happens or what is the reason why since the stability of the oxygen nitrates is increasing when we add a co-catalyst or when we add a catalyst. So these are two approaches, but the main thing which I will focus is, is on this initial decay. What is the origin of the decay of our activity? Because of course, to increase, as mentioned in the beginning, we have to increase the overall efficiency of the materials. And for this, we have to find the mechanism which are, uh, are responsible for the lower activities than we would like to have. This is just one small add-on which I added, which I also wanted to show you. This is, we are looking also at other approaches, how to increase efficiency. And we have figured out that we can have an increase of efficiency for, first of all, for single crystalline materials and then even for certain orientations. We understand from uh, modeling with Uli Aschauer in Bern, why it could be that the increase of efficiency is there. But what we also still need is can we use strain for increasing efficiency? And of course, at the end, we will have to do efficiency studies with a catalyst. And of course, we would like to compare this with modeling, but the modeling becomes more and more complicated. So the group of Uli Aschauer is working on using single atom catalysts on top of the oxynitrate materials to see whether we can understand this better. But you can see here just one example said we can have 30 to 35% of increase in efficiency by using a certain, a certain orientation of the material. Of course, we still have to figure out how to make use of this, but this is just one approach how we can think about increasing efficiency. But then degradation. This is now the main part is degradation. Where does it come from? How can we overcome this? Do we understand this? And of course, one approach is that we can do surface analysis because the surface is probably the most important part because the solid surface is in contact with the liquid electrolyte and see, can we see after the measurements, PC measurements, where it comes from. But if we do this X C2 with the standard for surface analytical methods like X pair, SIM, SLACE, so we have to think about what happens if we take the material out into the atmosphere, into a new environment. So we may have contaminations, artifacts from the exposure to atmosphere. And then of course, the other questions which we have is, can we have a method how to determine on a nanometer level, the possible uh, change of thickness, uh, thickness of change? So if, for this case, we use neutron reflectometry, which is a very, very sensitive method. And then of course, for chemists, it's important, can we see a change of oxidation state? So with a sensitivity of surface versus bulk, and if possible, in C to in operando measurements. And this is one part we are working very heavily on this. Can we do uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, not only X C2, but also in C2 or even operando. And this is, will be one part. I will show you some data on this. And then of course, we would also like to learn something about the evolution of the electronic structure and surface states. And for this, we do angle resolve photo emission spectroscopy, so RPES. So the first part, which I would like to mention is neutron reflectometry. We do this at our spallation neutron source. So in this one, in this building here, it's the AMO instrument in collaboration with Jochen Stan, who is a beamland scientist there. And Neutron reflectometry is, in principle, you can compare it just to optical reflectometry and then in this case, but you have a higher sensitivity in this case. So what you get there is more or less the reflection of neutrons from every interface, like you would get the same with light. So in principle, you can make a depth profiling with a concentration or composition perpendicular to the, um, to the material. So we can get this, but with a very high sensitivity. And we did this for one material. So for lantern titanium oxynitride, we did this before and after PC measurements. And without a bias, you can see there was no change, but with bias, we see a clear change in reflectometry. But then the more complicated part comes out of these reflectometry measurements is we have to get data out of this. And this is unfortunately not so straightforward. And it involves, again, a lot of modeling. So we have to get a lot of uh, additional measurements like roughness, thickness, composition, density of the materials. And, but then we modeled our data and we could figure out that we most likely have a change of three nanometers at the surface 
on the oxynitrate materials, which is probably or most likely related to a change of oxygen content at the surface. So meaning this measurement told us, yes, we have changes. And yes, these changes are mainly in the surface. And yes, it's in a very thin layer. It's three nanometers. So now we have to think about what can we do to measure something in a three nanometer thick layer. So which method can we apply for three nanometers? And as I said, our first approach was to go into X-ray absorption spectroscopy at the SuperXAS beamline at the Swiss light source. So in cooperation with uh, Martin Nachtigal, Adam Clark and Olga Savonova, which we can use this. And then of course, one approach, if you think about SAS is of course, SAS gives you very important information. You have, if you look at a typical SAS spectrum, you can, you can you guess the Xenus R area and the Xas area, the Xenus, so absorption near edge gives us oxidation state disorder coordination, while Xas gives us some coordination distances. And we are mainly focusing at the moment on Xenus. Exos is something which we hope to do in the future, but then we have to figure out does something change here. And the most important part, this edge will shift with the oxidation state of the material while we get information about order in this range here. Of course, the other thing is, if we look about, think about XAS is which elements we can access with XAS. And XAS is of course, depending on the energy we have available for the measurements. And you can see the one in blue uh, can in principle be accessed, but meaning already here or is it nitrogen, oxygen, we cannot measure directly. For this, we would have to go to a soft X-ray beam line, but again, this would be already at the edge of measurements. And if you think about an electrolyte, then we already have a problem because electrolyte may contain, for example, oxygen. But then we focus there on the K and, A edge, K and L edges of the metals. But as I mentioned before, one, one of the things which we have to think about is we saw from the neutron measurements that three nanometers would be the most interesting part to probe. But XAS is of course not a surface method. XAS is, a, is more or less a method which goes into the bulk of the material micrometers. So for this, we had talked to our colleagues at the synchrotron. So what can we do to really be more surface sensitive? And the ideas they came up with is, yes, we can do grazing incidents, XAS. Meaning grazing incidents have been put the sample really at a very, very shallow angle. And here you see penetration depth versus incident angle. And so for using our three nanometers of interest, we have to go to an angle coming in of the X-rays of 0.18 degrees. So meaning we have to come really in on a very, very shallow angle. And then you can imagine why we need an almost atomically flat surface to come in at a shallow angle to really probe this material. Then meaning we need to have thin films for this approach. And then we looked, we made some materials and we started well with our standard materials, so lantern lanthanum, titanium, oxynitrite. And then we looked at the lanthanum and titanium edges. And then what we see, and this is something which we were in principle slightly surprised also uh, from data from uh, Alex and John, we know that it's a, a cut iron is not always dull, but in this case, we see a reductive shift of the L edge lanthanum L3 edge in the bulk and an oxidative shift on the surface. So meaning we see that lanthanum is doing something. So lanthanum is not as dull and the oxidation state of lanthanum is changing. So meaning this is something which our first indication said, not titanium, which most people would consider to be the active part in the photocatalysis would be the active one. It is not, it's a lanthanum which changes because we can see titanium, we see no change in edge position. So meaning the oxidation state of titanium is not changing. We see changes in the pre-edge of titanium, which as mentioned before, has to do something with order or with disorder in this case. So meaning we see a change of order surrounding titanium but not of the oxidation state. I really would like to point this out again, that lanthanum changes the oxidation state and not titanium. So we looked again with a lot of modeling and with reference measurements and what really changed with the pre-edge of titanium. So, and we compared titanium to anastas. And more or less it looks like from the modeling is that the disorder around the titanium octahedra are related to vac vacancy generation, most likely to loss of nitrogen 
which also other people mentioned before, that nitrogen is lost, but the changes are, but the charge is conserved for titanium, meaning it's really titanium stays in the same oxidation state. So it's not actively involved here in this approach. So then, of course, after figuring this out, this would be then to make the next step is, can we do this now in operando? Can we make operando measurements on the photocatalysis to see really what happens during the process? And for this, of course, we had first to build an operando cell. And then we had to realize um, that, yes, we could measure with success the titanium edge and the lantern mass, of course, but for operando cells, with adding an electrolyte, titanium cannot be measured anymore because titanium um, is at the, at the edge already for XAS. And in this case, adding the electrolyte does not allow to measure titanium anymore. So therefore we had to go to different oxynitrites. So we moved to strontium tantalum oxynitrite where we can measure the A and B sites. And for this, of course, this is the cell we built to make in situ measurements. This took quite some time or in operando measurements. This can be also used in principle. It was built that it can be also used for the neutron measurements. So we built a cell where we can modulate the light and we, change, we can change the voltage and we can do measurements with uh, raising incidence class or neutrons in, with this cell. And then we looked at the Operandoxas, and the first thing which we see is tantalum is not changing during operation. So even with ramping up the voltage, we see a change which, which is within the error of the measurements, but we see again clearly changes of the strontium edge. So strontium is really changing. We can identify, of course, also a loss of nitrogen again, and we can say vacancy generation and healing during oxygen evolution reaction but we see a reduction of strontium with the applied voltage. And we see possibly, which have other people also report strontium, strontium oxide dissolution of the material. So meaning again for the strontium tantalum oxynitrate, we see that the A cut iron is active and not the tantalum, so the B cut iron. But of course, the important part is what I mentioned, is if we see a loss of nitrogen and we see changes of oxygen, it would be of course also important to get information about this. And mentioned before that we cannot use really XAS to do this, therefore we did some X, XC to XPS, and we looked in detail at the nitrogen and oxygen 1S spectra before and after. And what we could identify is that we see the generation of nitrogen oxygen species, meaning we have certain reactions which form nitrogen oxygen species on the surface, which is of course bad for us because this formation of nitrous oxides on the surface, which will block the surface sites on the oxide would be competing of course with oxygen evolution. And in addition, we see the formation of hydrophilic OH groups. But I, I would like to stress again, these are XC2 measurements. So it's still, we still have some doubts, but we are thinking about, we're building now um, transfer cells, at least to try to be as, to have the exposure to the atmosphere as little as possible, that we are, can be sure as much as possible about what happens here or do in situ measurements with XPS. So what we have so far is that the grazing incidence measurements showed us that we can reach a surface sensitivity with X-ray absorption spectroscopy of three nanometers. And that in this case, lanthanum behaves like a weak transition metal. So it retains partial 5D one electron density. The titanium shows sign of disorder, but the total charge surrounding titanium is conserved. So we don't have changes there. We see a loss of nitrogen of the lattice and hydrophilic hydroxy-like surface formation. If you use operando uh, grazing incidence measurements, but in this case on STON, so again, tantalum shows little to no change. Strontium reduces with increasing voltage. And this is of course an important aspect because from literature is well known that tantalum normally is an active site for oxygen evolution, for standard oxygen evolution reactions. So like for these materials, it's quite known that tantalum will be, is important. It's different to our case. And next we'll try to look in more detail in this and with more time resolution, it's just very, very briefly is uh, our 
colleagues at uh, Synchrotron developed a met method which they call MEXAS, so modulation excitation XAS, with phase sensitive detection, meaning more or less we wanted to go away from the very, very shallow angles to which causes a long pass in the electrolyte to be more straight on and where we are super sensitive to differential changes between success spectra. And in this case, we started to do this again with uh, strontium tantalum oxide. And we see in this case, really the electron hole formation that again, strontium is, uh, is reduced and we see quite fast kinetics and we can reach um, spectroscopic uh, velocity here of about 0.5 seconds. And again, the problem here, which we hope to overcome is that we can measure with this approach again, titanium, because we can, we don't have to go in and see shallow angle as mentioned before. The last aspect that which I would like to mention is our newest approaches, what we can do with large facilities to understand more as angle resource photo emission spectroscopy. And this is done at the address beam line in cooperation with Vladimir Strokov. And just a few words about ARPES, maybe it's not the most common message for many people is, what you do here is you look at binding energies and what you can measure is the distribution of photoelectrons. So in principle, similar to XPS, but you can do this <clears throat> as function of kinetic energy and emission angle. And you can do this under irradiation. So we irradiate the sample with monochromatic photons. And we don't use the standard uh, RPS. Standard RPS normally use this VUV. In this case, you would have a very, very shallow probing depth of half a nanometer. And as this is a different beam line, you have to think about seriously about uh, contaminations. So sensitive, you have extreme sensitive to surface contamination. So in this case, that is what, one of the reasons why we really use in this case soft x-rays, which is a specialty of Vladimir's group, is in this case, you probe in several, a few nanometers. So we can get more information than which is beyond the surface contaminations. And the energy range covers the L edges of transition metals and M edges of rare elements. And in this case, we get elemental and chemical state specificity. So meaning we get a bunch of new information. And so we did this now again for lantern titanium oxynitride, but this is, as mentioned before, this is ex situ measurements. We're working on to overcome this, but what you can see here is the first thing is what you can see, what, which we has already mentioned before, is we see clearly that the valence best maximum before and after changes, meaning yes, we are losing nitrogen from which uh, lowers the band gap. So we see really the nitrogen is getting lost. And one important aspect is what we see here is we see close to the surface titanium defect states. So there are defect states created close to the surface. And this is something which we have to keep in mind. We also looked then at really what this means. So we get, we get these defect states and depleted or defect states results in electron accumulation, which is very, very bad for us. Remember that we're looking at a photo anode where the holes have to go to the surface. But if we have now an accumulation of electrons just below the surface, then we will of course do recombination. And this meaning this is one, which is in this case, I think we are the first to find this, one of the methods to really which lowers the efficiency of these materials. Because these recombinations, of course, lowering our sensitivity. And this is something which we have to see what we can deal with this or how we can overcome this. And the same is in principle found also for the uh, lanternum A cut eyeing. We are losing nitrogen and we create also lanthanum defect states. Again, these defect states is a new is a new mechanism how we lose efficiency because they are a cause for recombination. And these recombination is something which we have to figure out can we overcome. And as I mentioned, it's the beginning and we see one slide and this is ongoing measurements is we did not see these initial decay of uh, efficiency for the oxynitrates when we added a co-catalyst or a catalyst on top. And this is now something which we have to figure out with all of these measurements again, with the added co-catalyst to see, can we understand what this co-catalyst is doing to have not these uh, things going on. So if we sum up now the ARPES measurements, then we have determined the electronic structure of the photocatalyst. 
and monitor its, its evolution as a consequence of the oxygen evolution reaction. And after the photochemical reaction, we observe a depletion of titanium and lanthanum nitrogen 2P states, meaning we lose nitrogen. So we have a disorder surrounding the local environment of titanium. And contrary to expectations, we have a formulation, a formation of an accumulation layer of electrons near the surface, which causes downward bending of the band edge. But this accumulation layer is really bad for us. It's really one of the mechanisms which lowers the efficiency. And this is really a new loss mechanism and which if we cannot overcome this will be a major limitation for oxynitrites. But as mentioned before, we have only done this at the moment for one material. So we cannot say, is this a mechanism for all oxynitrites or whether is this specific for lanthanum titanium oxynitrites. So I have now a PhD student working mainly on ARPES, really to trying to figure out, is this valid also for other oxynitrite materials? And of course, what happens if we add uh, catalyst on top of the oxynitride. And of course, uh, implies that the mechanism is more complex and we have to look really in more detail. Can we overcome this accumulation layer? Can we really get rid of this by adding a passivation layer or a catalyst catalyst on top? So I would like to come now already to the overall summary is, I hope I could show you that PLD or thin films are really ideal model system for it because we really need perfect surfaces to analyze the solid liquid interface in situ in operando at the large facilities. So X-rays, I hope I could show you that X-rays are very useful to use for this approach because we can get electronic structure and evolution by RPES. We can learn something about oxidation state, disorder, local geometry, electronic structure. So we can really get and we can do this in operando with light voltage temperature. So this is one thing which we hope also to apply in the near future is near ambient pressure XPS. So then we would be closer to realistic conditions. So we have a beam line which is doing NAP XPS at the synchrotron and we are now in contact with the group there to try to get access to this. All complement, these are all complementary techniques with, with advantages and limitations, meaning we have to apply a range of different methods. And also neutron reflectometry was very important for us, which gave us a, a really complementary data to know in which steps we should be looking for. Uh, originally, we hoped we can do this also in operando, but uh, neutron measurements taking so much time that operando is in principle post uh, mortem analysis. And of course, if you think about this, we are not limited <clears throat> to large facilities because you can get lab sources for XPS success and ARPES measurements. So of course we use at the moment uh, synchrotron because we have it there and we have access and of course the time scale for measurements is much faster. So our next steps, which, which is almost the last slide. So is we would like to complete the series of course, lanthanum titanium oxynitride versus strontium, strontium tantalum. As I mentioned, we had to change from one material to the other one because we did not consider that we run into problems with titanium using an electrolyte. Of course, we would like to understand what really the catalyst is doing when we add it. Remember the catalyst from of the initial slides is uh, first of all increasing, of course, the efficiency massively, but it's also stopping the initial decay of the oxynitride. Can we understand this? So meaning now we want to repeat all these measurements with an added catalyst. And nickel looks like it would be a good material for us to measure. We have started to do measurements with nickel on top. Of course, we need more operandum measurements to confirm the findings. As I said, we did it mainly for one material. So we have to figure out, is this a general feature of oxynitride? So is it really specific to one? Of course, one idea is, can we also use exhausts? Can we use exhausts to get something about structure? Uh, so can we use soft X-ray exhausts for nitrogen and oxygen? But I said, we have a problem here with the electrolyte and oxygen. The electrolyte for operandum measurements would be bad. Neutron reflectometry, again, we have done it only for one oxynitride and not with a co-catalyst. Again, we would like to repeat this. ARPES with additional oxynitrides with a catalyst and this is ongoing and hopefully soon finished. We build a transfer chamber to go directly to ARPA state, uh, to the ARPA beam station in C to, to make the measurements without contamination of the surface. So we want to do this really with 
going directly there. So the, stay, uh, the transfer chamber is almost finished. In general, we, we are trying to look at new materials, new catalysts, how to deposit, because it seems to make a big difference with the method, how we deposit the catalysts on top of it as layers, as, as um, singular nanomaterials. As I said, modeling is at the moment according to what uh, Uli Ashawa told me, limited to single atom catalysis on top. So which is of course nothing which we can really achieve with experimentals. And our new hope is that we learn something from near atmospheric pressure XPS at the beam line. So you can see already from this list and you have of course to realize that all measurements on using large facilities take a long time. We have to get beam time, measurements take a long time and anal analysis of the data is even more time consuming. With this, I'm more or less finished. I thank you for your attention and I welcome questions. And thank Alex is awake much. again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, Thomas. It was really very, very interesting and especially it covered a lot of experimental techniques. And uh, now I would like to invite the audience for questions. Please uh, use the raise your hand uh, option. And then uh, from the Eisner office, they will unmute you. So are there some questions? Uh, all right, I don't see any, any hands. So if I may start with questions, I mean, I have a lot. First, it was yeah. a very interesting presentation. Uh, I was uh, uh, so happy to see that lanternum behaves like a transition metal, something which we are trying to prove uh, for so many years theoretically, and it's so nice to see it also experimentally, that it could behave as a transition metal. Uh, my, my question is about the surfaces of those materials. Uh, so most of those materials, uh, so you, 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 you mentioned several times that you need atomistically flat uh, and uh, very well-defined surfaces in order to perform the, um, the, the, the measurements. But I wonder, is it one, uh, isn't this one of the problems? All those materials, uh, many of those materials should give polar surfaces. And um, you are stabilizing those polar surfaces, which will have huge dipole momentum there. And this huge dipole momentum will drive electron flow uh, close to the surface, most probably. Uh, and uh, well, the way I, I, I mean, the way I see it, when you when you when you talk about the effect of the co-catalyst, co I would imagine a co-catalyst would cancel those those dipole moments, and those dipole moments would actually be driving force for degradation. Just just a thinking, like a theoretical model, modeling thinking about it. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Okay, so one thing maybe I was not clear enough. One thing, of course, why we like these very flat surfaces, mm -hmm. if you have to come at this very very shallow angle. So if you mm -hmm. come in at point less than 0.2 degrees, of course, we need very, very flat surfaces. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we have problems with our measurements. And of course, mm -hmm. for everything really understanding fundamental or comparing to data from modelers like yourself is, mm -hmm. we, we would like to have very well-defined surfaces to have a model which is really, can be compared to the experiment. This is why we, we like to have control over the atomic surfaces. Mm -hmm. We are not completely there because we are not single terminated surfaces, at least not in all cases. We have to work very hard on this. And this, of course, is again, the next step, you know, much, much better mm -hmm. than myself is you can model, of course, a perfect surface and dipole moments on a perfect surface. Mm -hmm. But to make this experimentally is, is very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. And of course, the surfaces will never be single terminated. We have indications from modeling, for example, what I mentioned for these different mm -hmm. orientations, that this is related to surface terminations of titanium versus lanthanum terminated. Mm -hmm. But again, to achieve this experimentally is for us not so simple. But we need this for comparing directly to modeling. Otherwise, we would be reading in, right. the, in, the, in the coffee cup. So this is one of the reasons to, to understand this. And yes, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a dangling bonds, which I would call as a chemist and a surface, mm -hmm. and the role of the co-catalyst or catalyst on top, it will change it. And yes, this is one mechanism to improve it. But then we would need a complete coverage of it. But it seems like also um, nanoparticle positioning is also improving the efficiency and stability. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, not a complete coverage anymore, but this is something we are working on. We're trying to figure this out because the role of a complete layer, because normally people think in terms of 
you add a passivation layer and then you add the catalyst on top of the passivation layer. Mm -hmm. With our mm -hmm. approach, we are doing both in one. Our, mm -hmm. our catalyst layer is also the passivation layer. So meaning in, in principle, we, we make a different approach again, which goes away from, again, we have to, to go way steps in our measurements because mm -hmm. it, it's a different approach because with the thin film mm -hmm. deposition approaches, we make now out of two layer, one layer. Mm -hmm. But we, we know that the, that the layer on top, yes, is canceling the dipole interactions, and it's, but it's making all also more stable. And we are working on it's more making more stable because we don't get the accumulation layer, so we don't lose nitrogen. This is something we are presently working on to mm -hmm. understand this. What is the origin of this? Does the uh, nitrogen has gradient from the surface? Yes, it's mainly the surface where we lose it. It looks like in the bulk, the nitrogen still stays and it's mainly surface related. Mm -hmm. And also we have to figure out, as I said, so the changes is mainly related to the three nanometers we get from the neutron reflectometry. And mm -hmm. also from success measurements, we see mainly so of two, three, four nanometers. But again, we have done this now for single materials. So to say this as a general trend for all oxynitrides, it's too far for us. So meaning in principle, yes, yeah. it, it looks like, yes, it happens for something like three mm -hmm. nanometers where we lose nitrogen. All right, all right. All right, uh, are there questions from, from, from the audience? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Leonard, please. Uh, Le Leonard, you're still, still muted, uh, they will. Mute you okay. from there. Oh, yeah. Now you're okay. Yes, okay. All right. Oh. Hello, Thomas. Yeah. Good afternoon. I don't know. Oh, is it morning? Uh, it's what's the time? Morning. 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 Now, morning. Morning. Yeah. Now morning. I, I I see some light outside. It's not dark anymore. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's good. So thank you very much for this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I mean, it's really really interesting to see that uh, you see some. Uh, activity from the inside cation, especially lantern. And yeah. uh, uh, I, the first question I have for you is uh, uh, the oxy nitrates that you add to the material. The, the, the main idea is to control the band gap of the material or does it show any catalytic activity as well? The, the, main, the main idea at the moment is really is that the addition of uh, nitrogen really lowers, makes a band gap. Ah, lowers smaller. the band gap, so, yeah, that's all. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a main idea. So it's, we have not, the, the idea was never, so also if, if you look at the original papers of, uh, uh, of Domen, so it's really the main idea with oxynitrates is making the band gap smaller because titanium dioxide is a very good material for photocatalysis, mm. but you need UV light. And for solar, you must use yeah. really the, mm. the visible light. Whether nitrogen has to do something with it, I don't think so. But if you look at all material, if you look at all the papers, if you look at photocatalysis with titanium, most mechanism you can find in literature is formulated with involving titanium. Oh, in our okay. case, for lantern titanium oxynitride, it looks like titanium is not changing oxidation state as ah. a lanthanum. Oh, and it's the same true. for strontium tantalum oxide, where yeah, also strong... most papers it would be the same. Most people will claim tantalum is an is a active site, but we see the changes on the strontium side in operando. Yeah, right. Especially with the strontium, it's really, really strange. It's really, really strange. Yeah. So this is a complete, for us, it was also, as, as Alex mentioned, so they have predicted this <laughs> in the past, um, which I already doubted as a chemist always, because for me, it was always clear that titanium in this case yeah. should be the active mm -hmm. elements, because this is what we all learned in, in chemistry. Titanium mm -hmm. is a very good mm -hmm. material for this, but it looks like titanium or tantalum are not the important uh, cations in this case. We see the changes in operando, really, we see the changes on the A side. And how can we? Is there any possibility of trying to find out if the catalytic activity to, to really compare with the A site oxide individually to see whether we see any changes? Because it's like the only function in that order when combined. We, we could. So, this is, of course, part of the discussion we have with Alex. So, first of all, 
which, which is the right oxide to compare to the oxynitrite, so which structures is. But the problem we have at the moment is if we use an oxide, we have to go to UV light. Oh, yeah. Because the band gap for the oxides is in the UV. So at the moment, our setup store setups at the, at the beam line is not set up for this. But again, we have some much, much higher photon energy. Yeah. And we know mm -hmm. from ARPIS measurements that using a high photon energy is changing some materials partially just oh, by oh, photon yeah. energy. Yeah. Then we again run into two problems because this was one of the ideas also from the people from the ARPIS beamline that they say they can do UV during measurements, ARPIS measurements, and they see very often a change in materials and oxidation states of materials just due to the UV. So meaning oh. this, then again, we have two possibilities, but it's for sure something we try to look into it. Because as I said, for me, it was on the first side, it was, for me, it was very surprising that the A side is active and not the B side. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, thank you, Leonard. So uh, are there other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, uh, Khan, please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much, Professor, for your sharing. And I'm um, interested in the yeah, PLD uh, deposition. Uh, in your PLD chambers, there is only ammonia gas or there is some mix of other gases? In, in this case, we so for this one, we use only ammonia for the oxynitrites because you can you have to, you have to be clear about it. The material wants to be an oxide. So if we add the slightest source of oxygen inside, the oxide will be formed because we really have to work on forming oxynitrite. So the thermodynamically stable material is a, it's a it's an oxide. So if oxygen would be inside, then the oxide is formed. But we can add in principle many different gases. We do, of course, also many oxides, and then we use something like N2O, oxygen, we use nitrogen, we can use argon, we can use carbon sources, so CH4. In principle, we can do all of this. But we have five PLD chambers, so we have many different approaches. Oh, so I have seen your previous slide, you showed uh, the increase of ammonia uh, maybe concentration. So how, yep. how do you control that? Yeah, this one, how do you control the ammonia that you increase the ammonia pressure or what, what is the Yeah, we, we, we you know, this is a gas pulse and we just change the number of atoms by using a different pressure for the gas pulse. Okay. So the gas pulse, which we release whatever with two bars and we can change this from one bar, two bar, three bar of, of a pulse, uh, of a pulse gas, so then we change the number of reactive of ammonia at, uh, molecules interacting with the plasma. So we just change the number of, in this case, of it. Or in this case, you can also see also the surf, the temperature of the substrate has also an influence. With increasing the temperature of the of the substrate where we grow the thin films, we get a higher amount of ammonia inside. So there are two different levels. So one thing is really to use the pressure of uh, or the number of ammonia molecules or the substrate temperature, which helps us to increase and control, which is even more important. We can control to a certain amount the nitrogen content afterwards. Okay. In, the, in your reaction, what is the, the dominant uh, location of nitrogen at home? Uh, Nitro nitrogen should be, in principle, you have to think why ammonia is good as, of course, if you think as a chemist, so hydrogen is also reducing, so we're getting rid of some oxygen because we start with a target with the oxide material. So we want to get rid of some of the oxygen and nitrogen will substitute oxygen sites. So this is, this is the main, main thing, but ammonia works much better than, uh, than nitrogen. You can see here with nitrogen, our amount of nitrogen we get inside and the oxide is much, much lower than for uh, using ammonia. Ammonia is really the best. And what we see in the plasma is that ammonia gets decomposed during the interaction with the plasma species. You have to imagine that we have plasma coming. So the plasma is created by the laser, which expands with whatever, 20 kilometers per second. So with very high kinetic velocities and it's very reactive and it it really collided with the ammonia species. Then we can see the creation of atomic nitrogen and different NH species, which then reach the surface and during the growth there, nitrogen substitutes and part of the hydrogen takes away the oxygen, which is present from the target material. 
So meaning we have in principle really with ammonia, we have a reduction and a substitution going on. So this is why ammonia is so much more efficient than nitrogen. And of course, the band as you have to need much more energy to break nitrogen into atomic nitrogen. Okay. And one more thing, when you increase the ammonia concentration, is there any change of the oxidation state of titanium or something? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's uh, the same. No, it, it's not. It, it's it's the same. So because in same. principle, so I, I should write. So what we get out here is a strontium, titanium, oxygen X, nitrogen Y. So the differences between oxygen and nitrogen really cancel out. We have to uh, realize, of course, a nitrogen is, is three minus, oxygen is two minus. So it's not a one to one substitution. So at the end, the uh, oxidation state here is is always the same. We don't get different oxidation states depending on the amount of nitrogen we put inside. Okay, and oh, one more last question, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, of course. Uh, because the deposit by a field is very thin, thin so can you uh, uh, recommend if I deposit the oxide and just annealing in nitrogen, uh, in ammonia at the same temperature of your uh, reactor, do you think that we can make uh, Oxynitride. You get an oxynitride. We also do this sometimes afterwards. We can increase the amount, but not to the same level of nitrogen content we get during the direct deposition. So we are much more limited okay. in this. And the other problem is uh, if we anneal afterwards with high temperature, we, yeah. we lose one advantage we have that we can make a single crystalline or oriented films. During annealing, we lose very often this orientation. So we get an afterwards very often polycrystalline film, which is, of course, something which we don't want. Mm. Because as, as shown in this one slide here is, so said we see an influence, which is also, of course, one thing we are working strongly on it, an influence on the orientation of the material, which is, of course, something important for us to talk with the modelers to figure out why different orientations have a different activity. And this will be lost when you do annealing at high temperatures in ammonia. I see. That yes, you can, you, can get some, you can get some nitrogen inside, but less. It's less afterwards. Yes. Thank you so much. That's, that is a really important thing in PLD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you, and you lose the surface flatness. So you increase the roughness with annealing also very often. As you can imagine, if you go from a single uh, oriented film to a polycrystalline film, we increase the roughness. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank You're you welcome. very much for the questions, Tan. And uh, T, please go ahead, ask your question. Okay, um, hello. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, so for the sadness um, measurement of the lantanium, titanium oxide nitrides, uh, you said that the S position is shifted and from what I understand is edge position, the band edge. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So, yeah, this one okay. here, you see you see here shift of the edge position. So which an edge, edge position is normally related to the oxidation state. So okay. edge, edge position is oxidation state. So different for different uh, metals, of course, but this is normally, if you see a shift here, so normally it tells us the oxidation state of a material is changing. Uh, okay. So how do you expect the other oxide nitrides materials will change with the introduction with the introduction of nitrogen? Is it okay, already the, like this? <laughs> That's a good <laughs> question. So at the moment we see it for lantan titanium oxide nitride and for strontium tantalum oxy nitride. We see for both materials the same set. The A side cut iron, so lanthanum or strontium is changing oxidation state, while the B-side titanium or tantalum seems to be not really changing oxidation state, but, but more or less order or something like this, but not oxidation state. So meaning yeah. at least for two materials, we have measured that the A-side is changing. Whereas this is true for all possible combinations of oxynitrites, I'm not sure, but I guess probably yes, that this will be the case. So this is something which we have to we have to experimentally confirm. And of course, this is one step. The next step is of course for us to see, is the same still true if we add a co-catalyst? 
or if you add that catalyst. This, of course, makes it again very different because if you look at, where did I show it? If you look at this one here, no? so we see, of course, the efficiency is higher, but also the decay seems to be not be there with a catalyst. Mm -hmm. So since the question is, will this also have an influence of change of oxidation state or will it change the mechanism? This is something which we have to figure out. We, we have measured some of the things, but we have not analyzed. We have started to analyze the data, but we have not yet finished it. We looked at the same stuff with nickel oxide as a, as a catalyst, but we are still, the analysis is still ongoing. So at the moment, I, I, I cannot really tell what will be the case, but at the moment for two cases, I can say A side is active, B side not changing oxidation state. Okay, thank you so much. Um, do you have any speculation why the B side is not participating? Ask the theoreticians. <laughs> okay. I, I, I would have always written down a mechanism where the B side is active. As a chemist, I would I have not written something down where the A side is active to tell you the truth. Maybe okay. Alex wants to, want to comment whether it's easy to formulate a mechanism why this happens in this way. Uh, uh, it's not that straightforward, easy mechanism. <laughs> no, no, not, not really. Uh, okay, Tink, Tink, please go ahead with your question. Hi. Hi, Thomas. Nice Hi, to see you. Okay, thank you, this uh, really great uh, presentation here. I mean, I uh, enjoy it very much. Okay, it's a quick, quick question. I mean, you mentioned, okay, great to see again what right here. You have been proved that like the A side uh, is active side uh, experimentally. It's interesting here. It's my understanding those materials been working in the alkali solution. Is that, am I right? Yes, that's alkaline, yeah. So before and after, do you think, because normally this material, we know it cannot be the A side terminate. When you build the thin film, normally, so far we understand the A side is on the surface. So the A side, the A terminate, it reacts with somehow the alkali solution. Do you think have that kind of hydroxide or carbonate will form? Hey, so so thing my question then would be, I'm not 100% sure that we always A side terminated to tell you the truth. Right. Because this, this depends, if, if you look at the pure material, so this depends of course also on the crystallographic orientation mm -hmm. and then the surface energy. So different orientation will have different terminations. And in this case for lanthan titanium oxynitride, it may fit to this that the orientation which should have the highest amount of lanthanum at the surface is the most active. So this right. seems to go in your direction. So this okay. is, yes, but normally in PLD, what we normally see or what we normally say is that you have to work very hard to have a single atomic termination. Yes. Because yes. This, this normally you only can get normally if you have a layer by layer cross, a perfect cross. If you have an island cross, then you have all different stages of cross there. Otherwise, it must be a very, very different uh, surface stability from uh, for, uh, thermodynamic reasons to form a single termination. So in most cases, okay. when we do PLD films, we have never a single terminated surface. So we, you really have to work very hard for it. And it only you can really, I, I'm not so sure whether this is always the case that you have it like this. But what I can say is that it's uh, before and after measurements, we see that the A side is active, but for strontium tantalum, we also saw it in, in operando. So also in mm. the operando measurements, we saw in this case that strontium during the measurement in operando, no exposure to atmosphere during measurement, we saw that the A side is active. Right. It will be really interesting to see how, because my understanding, after the operation, the nitrogen will lose it. So it causes like a degradation that make it very different. Is that because yep. that is the, okay. How it is react is interesting. So if it's A side is active and how it reacts with the nitrogen or the oxygen there. 
And yeah. this, is, this, is a one, this is the one thing which I showed. So <clears throat> that we see, yes, we see a loss of nitrogen in the structure, but at least within the measurement sensitivity, I think you have also were involved in some measurements with uh, SIMS. So we didn't see a massive change of nitrogen content. And also Boy. with ERDA, we didn't see a massive change of nitrogen content. But it looks like that we are losing nitrogen from the lattice sites, but a lot of the nitrogen will stay at the surface as nitrogen oxygen species. Okay. So meaning okay. overall, the nitrogen is not completely going out, but it mm. seems to be said it accumulates on the surface and forms nitrogen oxygen species. But again, this is XC to XPS that we right. saw, okay. uh, NO2, NO3, whatever type of species on the surface. This is one of the reasons why we want to do these uh, near atmosphere pressure XPS, where we can do it in C2, so without taking a sample out and always with at atmospheric pressure, controlled pressure. Yes. yes. Because this is also something that in principle, so that this would be a competing reaction to the, uh, the oxygen evolution. So this would be bad. And also this may even block active surface sites. Mm. Yes. Yes. So, so this is something which we still have to figure out, but it's not what we see also, I think from SIMS, from ERDA, from whatever, from XPS, we don't see strong changes of the overall nitrogen content, just the way how nitrogen is present seems to change, which is of course bad for absorption, but also if nitrogen stays like this on the surface, we may really block active sites. And of course, it's a competing reaction to oxygen evolution. So this is also one of the mechanisms which lowers this, but I'm, I don't propagate this so strongly because this were ex situ measurements. And I, I would like to have this really in situ to really be sure about this, that this really happens not post, post mortem, yes. but that it happens really in situ. Then I'm sure Ooh. to tell you, yes, this is a problem. And this is something which we overcome and maybe we overcome with uh, with this catalyst layer on top. So maybe this is something which will not happen there. Yes, yes. Thank you. Right? This will be very interesting to see the, the result that right? the situ or in upper window will be interesting. Yeah, okay. I, I think this is also one thing which I would like to stress here. So specifically with everything surface sensitive, in situ or operando is, is a way to really be sure about the data, because we have seen very often that things which happened, happened while we transfer the samples from one chamber to the yeah. other. And if you, look, if you calculate this at atmospheric pressure, it takes nanosecond to have a complete coverage of a surface by, by gas species. So meaning yes. you cannot prevent, if you don't have whatever transfer chambers, that's why we are building now all these operando cells transfer chambers, because I started to get a lot of doubt about data we had with ex situ measurements. Yeah, particularly also the oriented film, after deposit, you take it out, you don't know, in the air, exactly. everything can happen, e yes. Exactly. This is what I, what I, the direction this is why we are now putting so much effort in operando cells and transfer chambers. So we're building now, we try now to add on transfer chambers to all of our systems to go from the chamber directly into a glove box and directly to a measurement chamber, or if possible to, to do really operando measurements at, at a really uh, analytical instrument. I think this is, to be sure, this is a way how to go, which makes life unfortunately much more complicated, <laughs> but I think this, this is the way how to go. Yes, yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question, Tink. Thomas, uh, I, I have a very fast question. So which A-side yeah. cations you have tried? I mean, I know about lanthanum, strontium, barium. What else yeah. did you try? This is the moment. So we, we also worked on uh, calcium niobium. Yep. But this is the moment, uh, the one which we, we at the, at the moment we, we did, of course, the ones which you found in literature, which show activity. Mm. And lanthanum titanium and strontium tantalum or barium tantalum are the one which perform best. So this mm -hmm. is the one we, we use most. But we, we can, of course, also now after we think about mechanisms, we, we also can think about of doing materials which are less efficient, but may give a better insight into the mechanism. But calcium, niobium, uh, strontium, barium, tantalum, 
and lanthanum titanium are at the moment yeah. the stuff we have done. Do you have an, an example of presidimium containing oxynitrite? They exist, but we have not done so until now. Yeah. The thing is both theoretically, I mean, mainly of talking with John, uh, we see that whatever we have as an effect uh, on lanthanum, theoretically, on presidimium mm -hmm. is much more enhanced. So, uh, okay, just something. Something recently, recently we, we were looking at with with uh, with uh, John and also with with some some researchers at University of Illinois huh? um, for very different materials. But wherever we find those interesting properties of lanthanum of being close to transition metal, we see them enhanced okay. on presidimium, uh, strongly enhanced. So okay. it might be it might be quite interesting. Presidimium, I just looked it up, so it should be exact. It should be. Mm -hmm. Well suited to do exhaust measurements, also operando. Mm -hmm. So I will, I will ask one of the students. Send me a reminder, Alex. That yeah, procedure yeah, yeah. is a good thing, and I and I will, I will forward yeah. to one of the students to say, think about an oxynitrate with prosodymium. Of course, prosodymium would be not not the one for application, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, but for, but but for understanding, to you, yeah, to show you theoretical the, theoretical results on prosodymium, yeah. so that yeah, yeah. All right. So if there are no other questions and I don't see any, 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 any hands up, then I would like to thank very much the speaker. And I, I, I would like to ask you to, to join me in thanking the speaker for this wonderful presentation, which was very exciting for us. And it was great to hear you again with us, Thomas. So it was very nice to see you again and talk to you again. Thank you very much for today. Yeah. I was happy really to see at least some of you, but unfortunately not in person, but I hope near future will allow us to meet again in person. We, we and of do, course, we, I would like all of you think about using large facilities. And of course, if you have a chance, come visiting me. So if it's allowed again. <laughs> that would be great whenever it's allowed. Uh, thank you very much to everybody for participating in this seminar. Thomas, thank you once again for yeah. participating and for, for giving this wonderful presentation. Uh, and thank you to the Eisenhower office for organizing it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. With this, I would like to conclude the seminar and uh, close it. So hope to see you soon, Thomas. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Hope to see you all soon again. Bye-bye. <laughs>